How you guys doing? We are the University of Oregon Gospel Singers. We will be singing a few songs for you to get this thing started. Now, um, uh, at one point in this uh, little set of ours, we will ask you to join us in song. Is that okay? Yeah. Oh, no, no. Is that okay? Yeah. That's more like it. That's more like it. It's not going to be hard. It's going to be three words. When that time comes, I will tell you. Okay? In the meantime, enjoy. This song is called The Best is Yet to Come.
All right. Now here comes that time where I was talking about where we're all going to sing as one. In one accord, we're gonna have a nice little mass choir going on. Is that all right still? Is that, can we still do that? Can we make that happen? Okay, so this song is called My Desire. Uh, many of you have heard it before. Some of you have not, but that's okay because you have three words to say. I love you. It's very simple, right? If we can spread a little love in our day, then you know, it's a good day. Now, we'll have times in this song where those of you who have a higher register, who sing pretty high, you can sing along with us. But the sopranos, <laughs> we'll be singing up. Can you set the key for me, sir? Here's what you'll be singing. I love you. I love you. I love you. I love you. Now, what, just, just so I can see, a sh uh, show of hands, where are those who have the high? There's one, two, three brave souls, four. All right. All right. Now, there are a few more of you who uh, might appear magically when we sing this song. Go ahead and sing it loud and proud, OK? I love you. Then the altos. You'll be singing with us. Those of you who have a kind of a mid-range mid voice, kind of in the middle of your register. I love you. I love you. I love you. I love you. That'll be your part, OK? And we're going to do it until you actually sing. So don't be afraid. Don't be scourged. Don't be none of that. All right? Be, br be proud, courageous. We like courage here. And then those of you who have a, a lower register, sing and, you know, you're basses and baritones and you're really cool. You know, you'll be singing with the fellas. I love you. I love you. I love you. I love you. So when we get to that part, we're going to break it down section by section and we're going to come together and do it in one accord. All right, we ready? The song is called My Desire. One time, now clap your hands, two times, now clap your hands, three times. Good, that's all we need. Go. My desire is to please you. Ooh, yeah. To be more and more like a change. Each and every, each and every day. Each and every day. I live my, I live my hands. hands. Hey. I want to be more like you. My desire, yeah. Hey. My desire is part I'm talking about. I, I hope you guys are ready. I, I hope you're ready. That's 
the note, ladies, with a high register. Your turn. I love you. Where you at? I love you. Don't be afraid. I love you. I see you here. Yeah. I love you. Altos. I love you. Midbrain. I love you. I love you. I love you. Your turn. I love you. Where you at? Your turn, go. I love you. I love you. I, I don't hear him. I love you. I love you. I need everybody to stand up. I love you. Come on. I love you. I love you. Come on, play with us. Yeah. Move along with us. Everybody sing. I love you, fellas. I love you, ladies. I love you. Hi, ladies. I love you. A round of applause, yeah. That's what I'm talking about. Gospel singers, thank you for letting us sing for you. One more? Okay, well, hey, we got another one for you then. Yes, we're gonna do um, something that we love to do. We do this just about everywhere we go. It's uh, the national anthem, but it is unlike most um, renditions. It's a little bit more dynamic. We like to throw a little something extra on it, if that's okay. However, we like to use it to give tribute to our great country and, and the uh, advancements that we've made as a people, as a nation, and uh, as a whole. So, I hope you enjoy it. Bye. 
would that all academic conferences could begin in that way. Um, thank you to the University Gospel Singers under the direction of Ann Beale Brown for, um, for that beginning to this evening's event. My name is Michael Moffat. I'm the Dean of the Law School at the University of Oregon. On behalf of the faculty, the staff, the students, and the friends of this university, it is my sincere pleasure to welcome you to tonight's event, to this inaugural uh, Derek Bell Lecture Series. Derek Bell served as Dean of the Law School here at Oregon in the early 1980s. He was a trailblazer in legal education in many different ways. He was the first tenured black professor at Harvard Law School, and he is probably best known as a pioneer in critical race theory. Um, he and his colleagues and his protégés um, have cast critical eyes on laws and legal institutions, even those that were designed and intended to address the effects of prior racial injustice. We honor his legacy um, in part by recognizing the centrality of diversity and inclusion in institutions of higher education, and in part by continuing these critical examinations that he helped to begin decades ago. This evening's is the first in uh, what aims to be a thought-provoking and perhaps even action-inspiring annual lecture series in Derek's name. Before we get, begin the, the, the speaker part of the program, I wanna recognize some of the partners who made this evening possible. The, uh, the Wayne Moore Center for Law and Politics here at the University of Oregon, the United States District Court for the District of Oregon, the Federal Bar Association of Portland, Eugene Weekly, and then many different people here at the University of Oregon. The Humanities Center through the O'Fallon Memorial Lecture in Law and American Culture, uh, the Ethnic Studies Department, the Oregon Center for Latino, Latina, and Latin American Studies, the Clark Honors College, the Department of Educational Methodology, Policy, and Leadership, the Oregon Graduate School, the Oregon History Department, the Office of Equity and Inclusion, um, the Triple PM Program, and the Academic Extension Program all have worked hard to make tonight possible. And another partner without whom tonight's event simply would not happen, um, nor would tomorrow's event in Portland, um, is the Honorable Ann Aiken. Um, Chief Judge Aiken is a 1979 graduate of uh, our law school. She was nominated to the federal bench by then President Clinton and has served as a federal judge for the last 15 years. She became chief judge four years ago, uh, becoming the first woman to hold that position in the District of Oregon. She divides her time between courthouses in Eugene and Portland and as all of you who know her know, is dedicated to improving the quality of life of both of those communities. We are grateful for Judge Aiken's support of the Derrick Bell Lecture Series, for her support and commitment to our law school, and of her presence here tonight. Um, Chief Judge Aiken. The second um, individual I have the pleasure um, of introducing is Peggy Nagay. Uh, Peggy was not able to be with us here this evening, um, but we asked her to uh, provide a video introduction to Derek Bell. Um, Peggy, for those of you who don't know, is, um, is maybe uniquely positioned to provide us with a personal introduction of the namesake of this lecture series. She worked as an assistant dean under Derek Bell here at Oregon, and they remained friends throughout their careers, a span of almost four decades. About Dean Bell, she says he was, quote, the best boss I ever had. Um, she holds degrees in East Asian studies, in spiritual psychology, and in law. Uh, Peggy co-founded and served as president of the National Asian Pacific American Bar Association. Um, she's highly regarded for her work on the National Japanese American Citizens uh, League Redress Committee as lead attorney for the um, Minoru Yasui litigation against the federal government, reopening his unlawful internment case, and as a presidential appointee to the Civil Liberties Public Education Fund. Peggy knew Derek as a friend, 
as a boss and as a colleague in the ongoing struggle for inclusion. And it is my pleasure to uh, ask you to direct your attention to Peggy's introduction of Derek and of this lecture series. I'm honored to pay tribute to Derek and to the Derek A. Bell Lecture Series, sponsored by the Oregon Law School, the Wayne Moore Center for Law and Politics, and the many other co-sponsors. I'm sad that I cannot be with you tonight, especially since I will miss seeing Janet and Derek III, but I am delighted to talk about Derek, his teachings, and the importance of continuing his work. When people pass, sometimes their eulogies can praise them as the most kind, most wonderful, most selfless person on earth, sometimes to the point of non-recognition. In Derek's case, however, those superlatives are true. I experienced them firsthand when we worked together at Oregon and since then. He was boss, mentor, colleague, and friend, but even more, he was a leader who integrated his head and his heart. Derek was kind, and he spoke out. He was soft-spoken, and he spoke his truth. Always hum humble, he still confronted authority. In his book, Ethical Ambitions, Derek wrote about areas that provide meaning to life, passion, courage, faith, relationships, inspiration, and humility. Throughout his life, from his lawyer days with the Inc. Fund to his creating teaching methods at Harvard, Oregon, and NYU, to fathering the development of critical race theory and writing his seminal treatise, Race, Racism, and American Law, to his protest for inclusion of women of color at Harvard and Oregon, Derek shouldered his work with courage and faith, and most of all, with love. Professor Patricia Williams said it well, Quote, he had a huge capacity for love, for justice, and for justice in the form of love, close quote. Derek remained humble and real while being the first and only in many areas, first in his family to attend college, the only African-American student in his law school class, Harvard's first tenured black professor, and the first black law dean outside of historically black law schools. With these achievements, many others would probably be boastful, if not arrogant, but not Derek. His work was his calling in the best sense of that Christian tradition. He once sense, said that if we could be true Christ Christians for 10 minutes a day, we could change the world. In an open letter of support, law professors described him to a T as a, quote, gentle, soft-spoken, deeply spiritual man who showed us that we retain our humanity through our relationships with each other, even with those with whom we disagree, close quotes. It is only fitting that Professor Haney Lopez be the inaugural speaker in the Derrick Bell Lecture Series. Given his recognition of Derek's prophetic words some 20 years ago, that racism would continue with little progress towards equality to uphold white dominance. Haney Lopez realized in order for Derek to reach that conclusion and write about it boldly, he had had to look beyond his own privileged status at Harvard and to recognize his connection with the whole of humanity. Derek also had to break the code of silence and collusion that is often the quid pro quo for people of color when they reach positions of status and authority in white institutions. But break that silence, he did many times over. At Oregon, resigning as dean when the faculty refused to hire an Asian American woman. At Harvard, protesting the school's lack of African-American women faculty. At Stanford, when his teaching methods were passive-aggressively called into question. So why are Derek's teachings and wisdom so important to remember, learn from, and emulate? For the reasons already stated, but even more so for you, and for the growth, courage, and love that comes from speaking your truth. 
By doing so, we bolster our own humanity, deepen our own self-respect, and experience our own true selves. Derek was an evolved soul who I had the privilege of working closely with, being part of his extended family, and sharing his love for justice and belief in courage. About courage, Derek wrote, quote, courage is a decision you make to act in a way that works through your own fear for the greater good as opposed to pure self-interest. Courage means putting at risk your own immediate self-interest for what you believe is right, close quotes. From this lecture series, may we each take a courageous step forward so that we move beyond our own self-interest to the whole of humanity and to realize, as Derek often said to me, in the end, we will not be judged by the results we attain, but by the quality of the struggle we maintain. Thank you, Derek, for your work, your wisdom, and your love. In the tradition of Derek Bell's inquiries, tonight's speaker invites us to consider the ways in which our political, political dialogue is encoded with racial appeals that have remade the very nature of race and racism. Our nation faces profound challenges to economic opportunity, for, particularly for the middle class, and tonight's speaker describes the popular enthusiasm for policies injuring the middle class in terms of dog whistle politics. Carefully manipulated hostility toward non-whites, especially blacks presented as criminals and welfare cheats, Latinos as an invading force of illegal aliens, and Muslims as terrorists. The result of dog whistle politics in recent decades has driven broad swaths of voters to adopt a self-defeating hostility toward government and has contributed to the crisis of the middle class. You may have noticed when you came and sat down that there are note cards on your seats. As you listen to this evening's presentation, if you have a question that you would like to have presented to Professor Haney Lopez, um, I hope you'll take a minute to answer the question and then at the appropriate time, um, some of our Wayne Morse Center fellows will circulate through the room and pick them up. I believe they have asked that you pass them toward uh, the aisles in order to do that. Tonight's speaker is Professor Ian Haney Lopez, the John H. Bolt Professor of Law at the University of California at Berkeley, where he teaches in the areas of race and constitutional law. He earned his degrees from Washington University, Princeton, and Harvard. Professor Haney Lopez has published four books, including White by Law, The Legal Construction of Race and Racism on Trial, The Chicano Fight for Justice. He has been a visiting law professor at Yale, NYU, and Harvard as well as a Rockefeller Fellow in Law and Humanities at Stanford. Professor Haney Lopez recently received an Alphonse Fletcher Fellowship awarded to scholars whose work furthers the integration goals of Brown versus Board of Education. Professor Haney Lopez is currently working on a book entitled Dog Whistle Politics, How Coded Racial Appeals Wreck the Middle Class. I ask you to join me in welcoming him to the University of Oregon as the inaugural speaker in the Derrick Bell Lecture Series. Professor Henry Lopez. Good evening, everybody. So they have me set up with a uh, head microphone and this, I think, can I walk? Am I still on? Oh my gosh, very impressive. <laughs> I'll just take my notes and cruise around. Okay, um, so, so I want to start, well, well first I want to start by thanking Dean Michael Moffitt and, um, and also for acknowledging uh, Janet Bell's wonderful to see you again and Art and Anita Johnson who I know were instrumental in putting this together. Um, uh, Eric Hoffman also, I'm not sure if he's, oh, there you are. Uh, Eric was also dealt with all the details, incredibly generous and patient with me. I want to start by echoing a lot of, of um, what we just heard 
um, uh, from Peking Nagay. It's an incredible honor to be the inaugural lecturer for the Derek Bell Lecture Series um, because Derek Bell was such an incredible figure. He, he really was a kind and, gen and gentle person and yet also a courageous uh, stalwart critic of racism and, and that's a remarkable combination. Um, uh, but I also want to start by saying that in some ways, honored as I am uh, to be here, in some ways I'm a curious choice to honor uh, Derek Bell. I'm, I'm a curious choice because um, for many years Derek and I were estranged. Yes, I was a student of his. I think I was a student in the last class he taught at Harvard. Um, before he left because of this protest over Harvard's refusal to hire any women of color in a tenure track position. Um, but I only made it halfway through the semester and then I left that class. And I wanna, I wanna start by telling you about that um, estrangement uh, because I think it goes directly to what I wanna say tonight. So in that class that Derek was teaching, uh, it was a seminar entitled Civil Rights at the Crossroads and we were reading chapters from a book that he was then writing called Faces at the Bottom of the Well, The Permanence of Racism. And the crux of my difficulty was in that subtitle, The Permanence of Racism. It was hard for me to take that seriously. Uh, here's, how, here's how Derek explained it in the text of his book. He said, black people will never gain full equality in this country. Even those Herculean efforts we hail as successful will produce no more than temporary peaks of progress, short-lived victories that slide into irrelevance as racial patterns adapt in ways that maintain white dominance. And I thought to myself, temporary peaks of progress that slide into irrelevance? Really? Slavery's over? Jim Crow's over? An African-American is a tenured professor at Harvard Law School? A young Latino is walking the hallowed halls as one of his students? I thought to myself, from reality as I understood it, that claim that racism was permanent was absurd. And then things came to a head one day mid-semester. The, the, the class assignment was to discuss the space traders allegory. So Derek often taught through allegories as ways um, uh, to use stories to focus attention on very important questions about race and racism. So in the space trader allegory, he tells the story of um, uh, aliens arriving from space um, uh, with a bounty. They offer riches to pay off the national debt. They offer a clean source of energy. Uh, they offer technology to clean the environment. And you can see this is in 91, but you can see how prescient he was. Um, but in exchange for all of this, these space traders ask that the nation give them the entire country's black population and it seems re-enslavement is likely. And the allegory forces this question. Would the country again sell African Americans into slavery? And answering that question, I said, no way. It just seemed impossible to me. It just seemed, yes, there are still problems with racism, but we're miles beyond slavery and we're not going back. And I remember distinctly Professor Bell's rejoinder he mocked what he termed my pie-in-the-sky optimism. And then he said that he thought that metaphorically the country repeatedly sold blacks down the river for short-term and short-sighted gains for whites. And many of my classmates joined in and seconded that notion. Meanwhile, I fumed. I felt that they were all playing at being radical that it couldn't be that we lived in a country that would in fact sell people into slavery or even metaphorically do so. And after that day, I left the class, I left the course, and I never went back. It would be 20 years before Derek and I overlapped as professors at NYU. I was there visiting for a semester. And that gave us an opportunity over a few meals to become reacquainted, to get to know one, one another once again. And I think it also served as a basis for uh, Bell's decision to invite me to give uh, a lecture at NYU, the Derek Bell Lecture on, on Race and Society um, uh, that honors him there. And I was very excited to give that lecture, very excited to accept that invitation, um, in part because I was really looking forward to speaking with Derek 
uh, and to explaining to him um, that I'd finally come to, to understand 20 years on that he'd been right, that racism was permanent, but that it was permanent, that I had been wrong to think that permanent meant fixed. A permanent didn't mean fixed. A permanent meant, as he'd said in that very quote, that racial patterns adapt in ways that maintain white dominance. And I'd been wrong on a second level, too. I'd been wrong to think that the measure of racism was my life, or Derek's life, or the election of Barack Obama. I was wrong to think that the measure of racism in our society were the lives of the elite. Because in remarkable ways, uh, the elites are now integrated, and there are deep problems with the way they're integrated. And for example, uh, Peggy mentioned one, that, that, that to the extent that you're a person of color operating at the elite level, you're expected to stay silent about race. B but understanding that, it's nevertheless true that in, in, in surprising ways, the elite are integrated. And yet racism continues in a way that we best understand measured through the lives of non-elites. Uh, and by non-elites, I mean people of color, but also whites. And so I'd looked forward uh, to, to, to talking with Bell about this. I'd look forward, in fact, to laughing with him when I finally conceded 20 years down the road that I'd been wrong for so long. Um, but unfortunately, uh, Derek passed away the month before that lecture, and I did not get that chance to have that conversation with him. As with any profound loss, as with any memorial lecture, there is an element of sadness because we are, we are coming together to memorialize uh, someone who's gone on to mourn the loss of a hero. In some ways, we're coming together to confront our own mortality and the profound question of how we measure our own lives' goals uh, in the context uh, of someone like Derek Bell. But it's also true that a memorial like this is a time of coming together in celebration, of coming together as a community, as coming together uh, uh, to find strength in one another and to find strength in the effort to recommit ourselves to the struggle that Derek pursued. And also, given that this is a celebration of Derek Bell's life, uh, necessarily a memorial for Derek Bell is gonna be a time to lift our spirits with song. And also, I think Derek would want us to laugh and to have a little fun. So, yes, this talk is going to focus on the permanence of racism, understanding racism as something that adapts and that also harms uh, the majority in society. Yes, it's gonna take that seriously, but at the same time, um, uh, I hope that we can find in it some humor and also some basis for coming together and working together and some, some inspiration. Okay, so the title of my talk, Dog Whistle, Racism, Race, and Politics in 2012. I wanna do three things with this talk. The first is I wanna talk about race and presidential politics. The second, and the far more important, is I wanna connect up race and presidential politics to the growing wealth inequality in the country. I think we're a country that is in some ways in crisis. There are levels of inequality now that are comparable to the levels of inequality that we lost last saw during the age of the robber baron. Public unions, public pensions are under assault. Workplace conditions are under assault. Working people find themselves forced into low wage labor or no jobs at all. People's values, their equity in their housing, in their, ho in their homes have been wiped out. There's an incredible crisis of the middle class that we're confronting. And yet, most people who talk about the crisis of the middle class never talk about race. And I wanna change that, and that's probably the most important thing, is to get people to connect up race and the crisis of the middle class. And then third, um, uh, and this is not unimportant, I also wanna make some suggestions about what we can do. Okay, so let's start with this idea of race and politics. And in that context, let, let's start with somebody who was once described as a redneck poltergeist, George Wallace. 
Now, some of you may know the name, and you may think George Wallace, and, and it may recall the sort of, the, I think, the most infamous um, uh, memory of George Wallace is his inaugural speech when he was uh, became governor in Alabama in January of 1963. Um, and he promised in his inaugural address that he would oppose segregation by standing in the schoolhouse doors. And he memorably said, segregation now, segregation tomorrow, segregation forever. That's the George Wallace that most people remember. But I want to talk about a George Wallace who existed before and a George Wallace who came to exist after that moment. George Wallace before. George Wallace, when he first ran for governor in 1958, ran as a racial moderate. He was actually on the board of the Tuskegee Institute. Um, uh, he was understood as something of a racial moderate. He was running against somebody who was supported by the Ku Klux Klan. And yet, in the royal atmosphere of the time, with Brown versus Board of Education pushing for integration in southern schools, it was the racial reactionary who won. And George Wallace, the racial moderate, lost. And there's a story, perhaps apocryphal, that sitting in the car just before he was supposed to go and give his concession speech, as he sat and dwelt on why he'd lost, he came to a conclusion. And getting out of the car, he turned back to speak to his cronies, and he said to them, well, boys, no son of a bitch is ever going to out-nigger me again. And what he meant was, I'm going to be the racial reactionary next time. And that's what he was in 1962, and that's how he won in 1962, and that's how he came to give that inaugural speech in 1963. And indeed, in 1963, in the summer of 1963, Wallace had the opportunity to stand in the schoolhouse door. The University of Alabama was ordered integrated, and Wallace went to the University of Alabama. He let the national press know he was going to be there. Uh, television reporters showed up. Uh, uh, newspaper reporters showed up. Uh, Wallace erected a podium. Uh, he staged a confrontation with the US Marshals and with a representative of the Department of Justice. But he did not shout, segregation now, segregation forever. Instead, he launched into a long-winded diatribe against the overweening power of the central government and demanded a defense of states' rights. And then, as he knew he would, he packed up, he left, he withdrew his, his uh, police forces, and the University of Alabama was integrated. It was all for show. Now, the nation watched that confrontation. And over the next week, 100,000 letters and telegrams arrived at Wallace's office. Did they condemn him? Was this a reign of criticism? From 5%, but 95% of the public who wrote in wrote to celebrate Wallace's bold stand against the federal government. And Wallace was struck by three thunderbolts. Here's the first. They all hate black people, all of them. This is Wallace talking. They all hate black people, all of them. They're all afraid, all of them. Great God, that's it. They're all Southerners. The whole United States is Southern. Wallace's first epiphany, racial anxiety, racial antipathy, was not a Southern phenomena. It was a national phenomena. His second epiphany, he had figured out the language that would be needed to trigger that anxiety. It wouldn't be the old language of white supremacy, which was increasingly losing favor under the onslaught of the civil rights movement. Instead, it would be what his biographer came to call soft porn racism. Dan Carter calls Wallace, said Wallace pioneered a kind of soft porn racism in which fear and hatred could be mobilized without mentioning race itself. And that was the language of states' rights. And now here's the third epiphany, the, the why do we care about Wallace at all? Because Wallace's third insight was that if the whole United States was Southern and he'd figured out how to tap into that racial animosity, that he could win the presidency. And so he ran for the presidency in 68 and then again in 72 and da-da-da. But we care really about his running in 1968 because he ran as a racial reactionary. He originally ran as a Democrat. He lost in the primaries. He ran as an independent. 
Um, meanwhile, Richard Nixon was running as the Republican uh, candidate. Richard Nixon was something of a racial moderate, and by the late summer, early fall, Richard Nixon was in a dead heat, and he realized that he was losing votes to Wallace, and that he needed to pull some of those white voters from Wallace, and so what did he do? Richard Nixon adopted Wallace's racial tactics. Nixon started talking about welfare. He started complaining about threats to neighborhood stability. He started to rail against forced busing. He started to stress the importance of law and order. Law and order as a way to, to tap into people's fear of crime, but also to tap into a, a powerful Southern critique of the civil rights movement. The civil rights movement had been historically dismissing civil rights protesters as nothing but mere lawbreakers to take away the moral grandeur of standing up against segregation by instead depicting these, as, these young protesters as juvenile delinquents who had nothing better to do than to break Jim Crow laws. Right? And so Nixon tapped into this. Here's a, here's a campaign commercial from 1968 that, that, that Nixon used. It had flashing images of protests, of riots, of police, and then a deep voice intoned, let us recognize that the first right of every American and here, notice how Nixon is capturing the civil rights language and making it apply to whites. Let us recognize that the first right of every American is to be free from domestic violence. So I pledge to you, we shall have order in the United States. This time, vote like your whole world depended on it. Nixon. Now, was race a subcode? Was race an element there? Here's Nixon after he watched his own commercial. This commercial hits it right on the nose, he said. It's all about law and order and the damn Negro Puerto Rican groups out there. Of course race was the subtext. Nixon knew it was a subtext. And in 1968, Nixon and Wallace combined took 64% of the white vote. In fact, from that year forward, no Democratic presidential candidate has ever won a majority of the white vote in this country. Not since Lyndon Johnson in 1964 has a Democratic presidential candidate won a majority of the white vote. So let's go on uh, fast forward. There's Ronald Reagan in 1980 who railed against welfare queens, who talked about black bucks standing in front of you to buy T-bone steak with food stamps while you wait in line to buy hamburger. He, he, he constantly criticized welfare and affirmative action. Ronald Reagan won in 1980 with a 20% surplus among whites, and then he won re-election with a 29% surplus among whites. George Herbert Walker Bush won by invoking Willie Horton, um, a, a, a black murderer who had raped a, a white woman, and he won using the Willie Horton campaign with a 19-point advantage. His son, George W. Bush, won re-election with a 17-point lead among whites after spending much of his first term in office um, uh, st stirring hysteria around Arab Muslim boogeymen. Meanwhile, what about the Democrats? Since 1972, Democrats have only entered the White House when they've come close to splitting the white vote. For example, Jimmy Carter came within five percentage points of, his, of, of Gerald Ford's uh, um, uh, percent, uh, portion of the white vote. Bill Clinton won by twice coming within 3%. And in both instances, it's large supermajorities among non-whites that pushes Democrats into the White House. So what do I mean by dog whistle politics? Dog whistle politics, we can understand in some ways as a generic term. Dog whistle politics is, a, is, yes, it's a way to speak in code. It's a way to communicate to a subset of the audience uh, solidarity or substantive agreement while, while not letting the public as a whole uh, understand the depth of your commitments. Does it occur outside of the area of race? All the time. This is, a, this is a highly fragmented electorate. There are dog whistle appeals on the basis of religion, on the basis of environmentalism, on the basis of social conservatism, for example, um, uh, abortion issues. Dog whistle politics happens all the time, understood as coded appeals. It's routine, it's unsurprising, and as studied ambiguity, it's entirely unproblematic. 
I really don't care that politicians talk in code. Of course they talk in code, they do it all the time. But this is why the title of the talk is Dog Whistle Racism. This is more than studied ambiguity. This is strategic racism. This is the strategic use of race and racial uh, animosity to mobilize votes. And it's this sense, it's the racism, it's the strategic mobilization of racial animos animosity and antipathy that is so reprehensible, uh, uh, that is so socially destructive. And so when I criticize politicians for being dog whistle politicians, I don't mean to criticize them because they're speaking in code. I mean to criticize them because they're trading on racism in order to get elected. Now let me say, this story of politicians trading on racism in order to get elected, routine, familiar. So familiar, in fact, that two different chairmen of the Republican National Committee have actually acknowledged that this is what the Republican Party has done and have apologized for it in 2005, 2010. Though, as we'll see, they did it again in 2012, so I wouldn't put much stock in the apology as signaling an end to it. Uh, but nevertheless, this story of politicians using race as a basis for garnering votes, um, uh, widely understood, or I should say also in some ways widely misunderstood. Because there's a second aspect to dog whistle racism that is key and that I don't think many people are talking about. And it's this, dog whistle racism isn't just about winning votes. It's also about demonizing liberalism. Dog whistle racism has a, has a particular substantive content that we have to understand in order to understand what's happened to the middle class over the last 40 years. And to understand this, we need to excavate another set of weathered bones from the 1960s, Barry Goldwater. So Barry Goldwater was a senator from Arizona. He was a libertarian in a sense of favoring small government, opposing social services, favoring the reduction of taxes, and otherwise propagating the idea of rugged individualism that it's the individual who should take care of himself or herself in society with, uh, without calling upon any help from government. Barry Goldwater was also the last holdout opponent of the New Deal. Because this sort of libertarianism that Goldwater espoused, that had been popular in the 1890s, in the 1910s, but certainly by the time the Great Depression rolls around, that notion of rugged individualism that we're all gonna make it on our own was completely destroyed in the public mind. The Great Depression drove home that we needed a different vision of government, a vision of government that actually stood to help people when the circumstances behind, beyond their control threatened their livelihood. And those circumstances could be changes in the economy or a boss or health care, their own or their families. And there was a sense that government had an incredibly important role to provide a helping hand. And so this sort of uh, small government libertarianism hostility to the New Deal was, was wildly unpopular. And yet, here's Barry Goldwater in sort of the last gasp defense of, of uh, this attack on the New Deal. But that's not all he campaigned on. By the time Goldwater ran in 1964, Republican leaders, or at least a faction of them, were coming to see that there was a racial schism on the horizon and that they could exploit race as a way of gaining votes. And Republican leaders as early as 1963 made a strategic decision that this is what the party should do. So here's the conservative journalist Robert Novak reporting on a summer um, uh, 1963 leadership conference among Republicans. A good many, perhaps a majority of the party's leadership envisioned substantial political gold to be mined in the racial crisis by becoming in fact, though not in name, the white man's party. Remember when a stoop party worker said quietly, this isn't South Africa. The white man outnumbers the Negro nine to one. This is in 1963, and the party leaders are saying, we, the Republicans, should become the white man's party. Now, I just want, I want to be clear. In 1963, uh, according to national polls, neither the Democratic nor the Republican Party was understood as more or less likely to help African Americans. They were both equally perceived to be supportive of civil rights. 
It's not that there was always a sort of a racial element in the Republican Party. Indeed, if anything, the racist party at the time was the Democrats, or at least the southern wing of the, of the Democratic Party, which definitely was the white man's party, which used fraud and intimidation and violence to make sure that no blacks could participate in the southern wing of the Democratic Party. So it's not that this had always been the case. Rather, in 1963, there's a decision that Republicans can finally make inroads on the Democratic majority, a Democratic majority that combined working class whites African Americans and Northeast elites, that the Republican Party can make inroads on, on that coalition by appealing to whites. And Goldwater agrees with that as a strategy. In fact, in using his, sort of one of his, one of his uh, uh, cowboy colloquialisms, he announces that the Republicans must, quote, start to hunt where the ducks are. And that meant that when he campaigned in the South, he campaigned not only against the New Deal, but he campaigned against integration, and he campaigned against the 1964 Civil Rights Act, and he, no less than Wallace, proved that he understood political stagecraft. So I want to describe a scene to you, because I, I just can't believe this. University of, uh, uh, University of Alabama, Montgomery, football stadium, Wallace is, uh, uh, Goldwater is set to appear, and he has the floor of the football stadium um, arranged with thousands of white lilies. And among these thousands of white lilies, he has 700 young white women. And they're all dressed in white gowns. And so Goldwater is going to stride out onto this field of young white women in the, in the purest white gowns, standing in a field of white lilies, just in case anybody missed what he stood for. Wallace and his campaign against the New Deal was crushed nationally. He lost every single state except his home state of Alabama, I was, oh, oh, home state of Arizona. And Wallace also won the five deep south states. And you have to understand how tectonic this was. The deep south states had voted for a Republican candidate. They hated the Republicans. They hated the Republicans as the party of Lincoln. They hated the Republicans as the party of Brown versus Board of Education. Earl Warren was a Republican appointee. Eisenhower had sent troops into Little Rock to force integration. The South hated the Republicans, and yet they'd voted for one. And more, the South loved the New Deal. The South, the economy of the South had always uh, uh, trailed that of the North. And the South in particular had benefited from the, the massive transfers of wealth initiated through the modern state uh, and the New Deal state, including things like the Tennessee Valley Authority, um, which provided rural electrification for millions of people. Now, Goldwater campaigning in the South said that he would sell off the TVA, that that had been a mistake. This was crazy talk. The South loved the New Deal. And yet they were willing to vote for him. They were willing, and here's what the conservatives recognized, they were willing to vote against the New Deal if hostility to big government was sugar-coated in racial appeals. And this is a, um, a sort of an epiphany of sorts for what I want to call the plutocratic agenda. And I want to distinguish the plutocratic agenda from libertarianism. Libertarianism says small government, uh, and I think really believes in small government. Plutocrats say small government, but they don't really believe in small government. Here's what plutocrats believe in. Here's what the very wealthiest in our society believe in. They believe in control over government. And through that control, they want two things. They want access to lucrative contracts, because government has a lot of money, and you can make a lot of money off of government. They want to use government in the same time to protect them from competition from others. And they want control over government so they can make sure the government doesn't regulate what they do in any way that harms their bottom line, for example, workplace conditions or environmental regulations. That's the first big agenda for the plutocrats. The second big agenda is they want low taxes. They want to preserve and protect the wealth that they've already gained. Now, there's a third agenda that follows from the desire for low taxes. They don't want government to provide social services. Why not? Well, they don't need them. 
they're fabulously wealthy, and they worry that social services are expensive and will ultimately raise their tax bill. But again, it's not that they want small government for the sake of small government. If there's thing that's, things that government is doing that's spending a lot of money, but that money is going to the plutocrats, they're all in favor of it. And that's why you get people like Ronald Reagan and the two Bushes who campaign, in a sense, as small government libertarians. They slash social services. They slash taxes and yet they grow government. And government grows because more and more the wealth of the government is being transferred to society's plutocrats. And the plutocrats realize the way to power lies through race. Now, let me break this down. Why, why if, if in 1964 the nation repudiates Goldwater, repudiates the attack on liberalism, repudiates an attack on the New Deal, why do they embrace that same attack in 1980 under Reagan and then ever since? Why? Partly, it has to do with the simple answer that there's an increasing amount of antagonism towards African Americans and a fear and an anxiety surrounding integration. So this is a quote from 1984. Um, uh, um, a Democratic pollster, Stanley Greenberg, was hired to figure out why so many Democrats, so many white Democrats, were defecting to vote for Ronald Reagan. And this is what Greenberg said. Blacks constitute the explanation for their vulnerability and for almost everything that has gone wrong in their lives. Not being black is what constitutes being middle class. Not living with blacks is what makes a neighborhood a decent place to live. So there's a worry there's a worry about uh, um, increasing integration. There's a worry that now blacks symbolize what's going wrong in people's lives. Um, on top of that, there's a resentment of social programs that help African Americans and other non-whites, social programs like welfare, like affirmative action. Um, there's also a resentment of government for not being sufficiently uh, punitive with respect to non-whites. And this is sort of this big push for a war on crime. But, but here's the crucial point, and here's the crucial jump. It's not just resentment of non-whites. It becomes a resentment of government itself. And it becomes a resentment of government because there's a sense that government's to blame. Government's giving things to these undeserving minorities. Government's coddling them in the criminal justice system. And more than anything else, it's government that's forcing whites to confront integration. Forcing them to confront integration in schools, uh, in neighborhoods, and in their workplaces. And this has an enormous consequence because now, Rather than most working class whites, middle class whites, seeing the greatest threat to them being the economy or concentrated wealth, they begin to see the greatest threat to them as government. And so this is Greenberg again. These white democratic defectors express a profound distaste for blacks, a sentiment that pervades almost everything they think about government and politics. These sentiments have important implications for Democrats as virtually all progressive symbols and themes have been redefined in racial and pejorative terms. Let me just repeat that. Liberalism itself became redefined in racial terms. Whites came to resent liberalism because they felt that it was government that was coddling non-whites and that was forcing them uh, uh, to associate with non-whites it was forcing them to undergo integration that they resented. Welcome to 2012. What happened in 2012? Well, certainly you see the first element, the sort of naked efforts to pander for, to, to, for, uh, for white votes through coded racial appeals. I don't know if you remember, John Sununu took to calling President Obama lazy. Uh, uh, Newt Gingrich described him as a food stamp president. Sarah Palin criticized his shuck and jive on Libya. Uh, uh, but, but these are somewhat marginal. What about Mitt Romney? Well, Mitt Romney, you may recall, ran that ad that said, under Obama, you don't have to work. They just send you your welfare check. Now, this was a distortion of a very minor change in welfare policy, but here was uh, Romney saying, Obama is just going to be sending out welfare checks to all of these people. 
That idea was very quickly debunked. It was one of those political facts, uh, a pants on fire sort of thing. And it's in response to the criticism of that commercial that one of Romney's campaign officers said, we won't let our campaign be driven by the facts. Right? And Romney spent half of his campaign budget over the summer running those welfare ads. He clearly understood the racial dynamics of what he was doing, and he chose to campaign on that basis. Fine, but here's the, here's the most important point. Here's what I really want, to, want you to focus on. This isn't the main way in which plutocratic politics played out. The main way in which plutocratic politics played out was in this, was in this notion uh, that Romney could say that 47% of the country were takers and that people would still vote for him, that he could have a, that, that he could have a vice presidential, presidential campaign a candidate, Paul Ryan, who proposed a budget, budget cuts that would have averaged $300,000 per person making over a million dollars a year and that people would still vote for them, right? They ran on a plutocratic platform. How do they do? Yeah, they lost. How'd they do among whites? Among whites, Romney won 59 to 39 percent. What about white women who are, who are to be more progressive? 56 to 42 percent. What about among young whites, supposedly the post-racial generation? Romney still won 51 to 44 percent. What about regionally? Only four states in the country, in only four states, did a majority of whites vote for Obama. And neither California, where I'm from, nor Oregon are among those four. Okay. Um, oh, and one last point. We can think about the, the, the proportion of voters who voted for Romney in terms of race, but we can also think about the proportion of Romney voters in terms of race. Among Romney voters, what's the racial breakdown? over 90% white. Or how about this? In terms of elected officials, elected state officials who are Republicans, all across the country, 98% are white. The Republican Party today is a white man's party. They did achieve what they set out to do in 1963. So what can we do about it? I want to suggest a couple of different solutions. First, for Obama, should Obama start talking about race? No. I think it's too dangerous. I don't think he can change it. I think that the politics that, that demonizes race is so developed, it's so strong, that Obama would be destroyed if he were to address race directly. But, one, he needs to free his allies to, talk, to start talking about race. The administration has put a lot of pressure on civil rights groups to not address race, to, to not agitate people around racial ideas, and he needs to back off and let his allies talk about race. Two, Obama needs to do what I'm very glad to see he's starting to do in his second inaugural address, provide a more robust defense of liberalism. Three, Obama needs to name names. People want to know who's to blame, and this is what the right understands, and the, the right has been manufacturing a culprit for the last 40 years, and that culprit is people of, people of color and liberal government. Uh, some social critics said, um, resentment abhors a vacuum. People need to know who's to blame, and Obama needs to spell that out. Um, next, civil rights groups. Civil rights groups today are acting like it's 1970. They're acting like it's 1970 in the sense that they understand that they're defending civil rights gains that are under attack, but also in a way that presupposes that we understand what the racial problem is in society and what the goal is, defending these civil rights gains of the 60s. I want to suggest that today's situation is a lot more like 1920. 1920, not in the intensity of racial oppression, yes, things have changed, but rather in how racial oppression is viewed. In 1920, whites were complacent about race. They thought they'd solved the main race problem in society, slavery. They thought there was very little racial discord. Uh, they thought there was racial contentment. They assumed that blacks would become equal eventually, several hundred years down the road. And in 1920, an upstart civil rights organization, the NAACP, committed itself to the project of convincing whites that race remained a major problem. And they did so 
by illustrating the power of lynchings and the violence and brutality of lynchings as a way to illustrate the violence and dehumanization attendant to race and to get whites to understand that race remained a problem. And I want to suggest that for the civil rights movement, for civil rights organizations, that's closer to where we are now, a period in which most whites and indeed most non-whites assume race is no longer a problem. When in fact, we have two million people in jail and in prison, whereas in 1970 it was 200,000. When in fact, we're deporting 400,000 people a year. When in fact, the middle class is in crisis, especially because of the way race has been used. Right? Race remains an incredibly destructive social force and we need the civil rights movement, civil rights organizations to take the leadership role in making that plain to people. And let me just say this, they can't do so by poll testing their message. Because you can't poll test against the common sense that racism is over. They need to break away from the polls and stake their credibility on the claim that race continues to be a major problem. Two more groups. One, Progressive Foundations, and the next, you. Progressive Foundations. Progressive Foundations need to do the above, but Progressive Foundations need to realize that liberalism as a set of ideas needs long-term defense. The right has been investing for 40 years in putting money behind conservative ideas, these sorts of rationales for plutocratic politics. I think in a sort of a you know, marketplace of ideas sort of way, liberalism triumphs, but the marketplace is not even. It's not an even playing field. One side has a tremendous amount of resources that they're putting behind a set of pernicious ideas, and the other side is cruising along thinking that liberalism is so obvious it doesn't need to be defended. And I think that, this, and then I think that the progressive foundations need to understand, yes, it's important to do work that has deliverables, but also they need to do a long-term investment in defending liberalism. Finally, the public. First and foremost, we all as members of the public need to start talking about race and racism. Uh, second, we need to call out dog whistle racism when we hear it. Uh, when people start using coded racial appeals, we need to name it, we need to contest it. Third, we need to recognize that the goal is not to elect Democrats. The goal is to elect liberals. It's to reinvigorate a notion of government for the majority of people. Now, in some contexts, that might mean voting for the Democrat over the Republican, but it also will mean, it will certainly mean organizing outside of the Democratic Party to put pressure on the Democratic Party itself. Now, last, what happens when you try and talk about race and racism in the current milieu? You are accused of being a racist because the person under the current sort of dog whistle frame, the person who first mentions race explicitly is the troublemaker, is playing the race card, is the racist. More than that, because there's now a common sense that we're past racism, the person who talks about race is seen as a little bit crazy. You're challenging common accepted wisdom, and when you challenge common accepted wisdom, you seem a little bit crazy. And I want to say, we got to be crazy. OK, I'm going to stop here. I'm going to stop. But, but before I do, I want to conclude uh, by switching back to Derek Bell. What did Bell say? Uh, what did he say we should do when we confronted uh, the permanence of racism? So in his, book on the, uh, in his book, Faces at the Bottom of the Well, he closed with an epilogue that was entitled Beyond Despair. And there he offered this I think really uh, um, uh, an injunction that we can really take to heart. He said, in these perilous times, we must do no less than our enslaved ancestors did. We must fashion a philosophy that both matches the unique dangers we face and enables us to recognize in those dangers, in those dangers opportunities for committed living and humane service. And I was going to close, I was going to close by saying that we should honor Derek Bell exactly because his life exemplified a person who sought out opportunities for committed living and humane service. But let me instead close this way, thinking about this idea of, of being crazy to talk about racial justice. I think we best honor Derek and seek to be like him 
because when it came to social justice, Derrick Bell was just a little bit crazy. Thank you. For those of you who have not yet submitted questions, if you have them, we invite you to raise them and we will do our very best. Um, I already have a stack of questions that would easily constitute several final exams in any course you would teach. Um, Pass them to me. Exactly. <laughs> so there goes your spring work right there. Exactly. Um, could you start by saying a little bit about um, most recent politics, in particular, whether the Tea Party or other populist, um, combining several questions here, of other forms of populism on both sides of the spectrum, um, do they change in any way the kinds of um, dog whistle politics, in particular on the rhetoric of dog whistle politics? I, I'm, I'm, uh, thank you for the question on the Tea Party. I wonder, can you hear me? Is this mic working? Or, all right, let me go back over here. Uh, uh, so thank you for the question on the Tea Party. The Tea Party, uh, let me start by saying the Tea Party is a great way to provide an important a qualification to what I'm saying. Clearly not all whites who vote Republican do so because they're stirred by racial anxiety. And yet many, many of them do. Um, uh, how many? Well, at the height of the Tea Party's popularity, perhaps one quarter of all voters identified themselves as strong supporters of the Tea Party. And when we examine what animated the Tea Party, we see um, the, the, uh, a priority given to racial themes. So what are the themes that most animated the Tea Party? Hostility to Obama himself. Uh, doubt that this black man could be a legitimate president, perhaps because he was a non-citizen, um, um, uh, you know, the, the whole Bertha thing. Um, we see a deep concern about Islam abroad and also domestically, really strident objections to things that were patently ridiculous, like the spread of Sharia law uh, in Kansas. Right? I mean, it's just, that's just not all right, but this is a deep fear. Deep hostility to illegal aliens, under, undocumented immigrants understood as illegal aliens. Um, um, a willingness to believe that there were black militant groups that threatened violence against whites, the new Black Panther Party, right? The, these sorts of things. These are deeply racial themes that coursed through the Tea Party. Yet, and I hear, I, I, wanna, I wanna say something, a, a second caveat. It's also clear that people who are strong Tea Party supporters really resented the idea that they were racist. They absolutely were livid about that idea. And I wanna say that if we understand racism as hate every black person racism, I guarantee a lot of them were not racist at all, that they're really decent people. So for some people who respond to dog whistle appeals, they consciously hear an appeal to racial solidarity. They, 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 Reagan talks about welfare queens and they hear, yeah, that guy's gonna stand with me against all those threatening black people. But I don't think that's how most people who respond positively to dog whistle politics, um, that, how they process it. Rather, it seems like the truth, it seems like common sense that there are too many black people on welfare, that there are too many illegal aliens, uh, that affirmative action is discrimination against whites. That is, I think that, that it's race sort of operating as a cultural common sense at a non-conscious level that is fueling a lot of this. One last comment about the Tea Party. Um, dog whistle politics, yes, doubly so. Not only in the sense of racial appeals, but in the sense of money. Where'd the money come from for the, the Tea Party? Where'd the organization come from? It came from uh, plutocratic funders like the Koch brothers, and a lot of the organization and training and advertising came through Fox News, right? That is, a lot of plutocratic money went into funding the Tea Party. And so the Tea Party combines both elements, both the sort of this 
populist racial anxiety and also a big money agenda to harness racial anxiety to a plutocratic agenda. Several audience members are hoping that you can say a little bit more um, not about the methods of attacking liberalism, but about what you would define as those things core to liberalism that need such defense. Sure. I think the core of, or let me try it this way. Liberalism has two meanings. Liberalism has a, a, a sort of a classic sense of liberalism. Let's call it a pre-New Deal sense of liberalism in which, uh, that's really connected to the founding of the country. And it's a vision in which the individual needs protection against government. And it's this vision of liberalism, for example, that gives us the Bill of Rights, right? And we think about freedom of speech, freedom of religion. This is a vision in which it's government that's a threat to our, to our freedom, our, our liberty, our ability to express ourselves. And that's right. That's a very important understanding of liberalism. But it's an abstract conception of liberalism, which doesn't understand that people aren't free. They can't express themselves. They can't engage in full human flourishing if they're hungry, or they lack shelter, or they don't have a job, or they worry about health care, or they're busy taking care of a loved one. Right? And this was the was a sort of profound, transformative recognition of the New Deal, that we didn't just need freedom from government. We needed freedom through government that government had a really important role in dealing with the vicissitudes of life. And that this wasn't just incidental, that, it, that the role of the government wasn't simply to perfect the market and let the market work efficiently so that it would, and then let the market take care of this. This was a complete reorientation towards government. This is, a, this is a sense that there's an important role for the state and that the role of the state is to afford to as many people as possible the best chance possible of full human flourishing. What does that mean? Education, health care, basic subsistence income, um, uh, protections against workplace abuse, right to unionize, um, uh, environmental regulations, infrastructure, uh, job training, the sorts of things that laid the groundwork for the next growth in the economy, right? And I wanna, I wanna say, this is a liberal vision. This is not what the right will say as communism or socialism. This is not centralized planning of the economy. This is not big brother da 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 da. This is a sense that government has a role. And what is that role? It's to promote human flourishing in as many people as possible and that it does that best by understanding that it needs to protect people against the vicissitudes of life. And also, let's be clear, it does that best also by promoting uh, a, a robust uh, um, uh, economic capitalist system, right? This isn't, there's nothing anti-capitalist about this. That's, that's crucial to people's welfare. But the end goal is people's welfare, not the perfection of capitalism for its own sake. This is, um, of course, the Derek Bell um, lecture, and so I think it's important uh, to, to invite you to at least say some words about your assessment of one piece of Derek's focus, which um, was specifically on higher education, um, not just about law schools, but about access and, and inclusion in higher education, perhaps in law school, but maybe more broadly for the audience. And I wonder if you could say a word or two about that. Right, right, right. Currently, education for many conservatives, for many Republicans, is a way for private enterprise to profit. What we see is massive amounts, massive subsidies, for example, to people coming out of the military that are being routed to for-profit educational institutions which have fraudulent claims about graduation rates, fraudulent claims about employment, um, uh, um, horrific levels of matriculation, of graduation. But what they do have is um, uh, 
sort of a, an iron grip on people once they become indebted. Right? You cannot um, dispose of educational debts through the bankruptcy process. That's insane. Right? That's another way in which this, Im this central task of modern liberalism to promote human flourishing by making education affordable uh, and widespread and accessible has instead been seen as another aspect of government that can be hijacked and milked for all it's worth. So no, I think that we do need a recommitment to education. Uh, and I think that, that Derek, one of the things that Derek was very clear on is a recommitment to equality in education should not focus on access to the most elite institutions. One of the things he pointed out is that if all the affirmative action, all, that all the affirmative action at the elite institutions amounted to only a few thousand students a year, whereas when we close our community colleges or when we cut off access to our state colleges and our state universities, we're affecting tens and hundreds of thousands of students of color every year. So I think that there, I think Eric would say there is an incredibly important role uh, for the state to play in providing education, and that it need not be the most elite education, but it ought to be education with an eye towards accessibility and excellence for as many people as possible. And the last of our questions this evening before we will invite our, our gospel singers up um, comes from a student and therefore is predictably the most intelligent of the cards I read. Um, it invites you um, to, uh, to, to share some thoughts, um, not just about the strategy and passion required, um, but, but specifically invites you uh, to say something about the role of love for the individuals to sustain the um, the efforts uh, you describe. I think it, it's hard for me. I think that, that love was something that, that Derek focused on. Um, but I worry about love. I, I worry about love. Um, because that sort of language is so intense and it's so difficult to sustain. Uh, and, and I think it's, it, it's what makes Derek heroic in, in the eyes of so many of us, but also an unobtainable ideal. So let me, let me say something else. Let me talk instead about self-forgiveness. And it's a version of love. Love asks that we treat other people as we, as if we love them, as if they were kin, as if we would sacrifice ourselves. Indeed, it does ask us to sacrifice ourselves for them. And I think that's an ideal that we should aspire to. But I don't think it's an ideal that we can ever fully achieve. And what happens when we fall short? What happens when we can't give fully and sacrifice ourselves for others, including for strangers? I worry that too often people on the left um, fall into a pattern of, of recrimination, of, of um, frustration, and of a feeling of um, unworthiness. Like they, they couldn't give enough, they couldn't achieve enough, they weren't good enough, and ultimately they risk abandoning any effort. They risk burning out. And so I wanna say, I think it's incredibly important that we do our best, but I think it's incredibly important that we, that we forgive ourselves when we fail to achieve perfection, when we fail to give absolutely everything that we can, when we fail to do all that we could, when we carve out some time for ourselves and our family. And I, I don't want uh, self-forgiveness to be an excuse for apathy, not at all but I want it to be, maybe this way, I want it to be a compliment to love. Yes, follow Derek's injunction to love others and to, to see them as human, to love them as human, to sacrifice for them, and forgive yourself when you can't quite follow through, but just do your best. That's what I'd say. <laughs>
Wasn't that great? So um, what we're going to do right now is we have a, 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 a one more song to give you as a kind of our way of saying thank you to our uh, distinguished speaker and thank you for all of you for uh, participating in this uh, inaugural event. The song is called Thank You. Thank you. 